The entire oral tradition uh, was not written down. Um, the oral tradition was given to Moses at the same time that he was given the tablets and given the written Torah, the five books of Moses. Uh, he was also given an oral tradition at that time, and that was also handed down for many, many centuries. In fact, until the second century, uh, it was handed down, and then um, it was written, it was handed down orally, with people making notes and things like that, but there was no formal uh, written oral tradition. But because of the persecutions they were suffering under the Romans and uh, the fear that much of the oral tradition was going to be lost, so some of the sages under the leadership and guidance of Rabbi Judah the Prince, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, wrote down the Mishnah, which is the uh, basic kernel of the Talmud. And um, at the same time, more or less, the Kabbalah was written down in the form of the Zohar and uh, several other Kabbalistic works as well at the same time, more or less, uh, more or less at the same time. Kabbalah, as I said, means Jewish mysticism. So it's important not only to put the accent on mysticism, it's important to put the accent also on Jewish. In other words, that Kabbalah is a mystical tradition coming out of Judaism and therefore is an inextricable part of the Jewish religious tradition, meaning its theology, its laws, its rituals, its holiday observances, and you cannot detach Kabbalah from Judaism. It would be like having a premise without a conclusion, which is a fallacy. And I say this because many people today are maintaining, and you see advertisements for courses today in Kabbalah, where they say, well, this has nothing to do with Judaism. It's impossible to have Jewish mysticism without Judaism. So Kabbalah is the mystical tradition of Judaism. This goes back to the whole issue raised by the Sefer Yetzirah and other forms of Jewish cosmology, how the world came into being. In other cultures, you had a variety of ideas, let's say in mythologies, of how the world came into being through a fight between the gods, through the death of a god and using the body to be the basis for the world or for human beings or something like this. Uh, you have legends about the world coming from a hatched primordial egg. You have all kinds of legends. In Jewish tradition, you have a kind of, I would say, unique view. And that is that the key to creation is language. That language brought about the creation. After all, in the biblical story of creation, we read, God said, Let it, I want to create this, and there it was. So the idea was that the world was created through the use of language, particularly the Hebrew language. So therefore, if you could master the permutations of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, particularly the permutation of the letters of certain words in the Hebrew alphabet, like the ineffable name of God, called in fancy language the Tetragrammaton, then you could undertake creative activities of your own. And one example of this that comes out of the Sefer Yitzhira, it's found in the commentaries of the Sefer Yitzhira, not in the book itself, is a, an idea that floats through the history of Jewish mysticism. It's found in many novels today even, and that is the idea of the, what's called the golem, namely the creation of artificial life through the manipulation of certain letters of the Hebrew alphabet as the key to creation. Now, if this idea sounds very outlandish, consider, if you will, how we look at the new discoveries about genomics. The genome is presented as being represented, the four nucleotides of which we're all composed are represented by four letters, G-A-T-C, and the combination, recombination of those letters leads us to knowledge, hopefully, of how to cure disease and even how to create life. This is essentially the exact same idea as you find in the commentaries to the Sefer Yitzhira and in certain uh, 
uh, Jewish mystical texts. So the idea was that, yes, the Sefer Yitzirah was used uh, to create things if you mastered the techniques that the commentaries explain as being implicit within this very short treatise, the Book of Formation or the Sefer Yitzirah. Magic plays a big role in Jewish magic and Jewish superstition, in um, Jewish mysticism and Jewish superstition. Today, a lot of these ideas sound very quaint to us, but I would suggest that we look at them another way than we usually do. Rather than simply look at them as superstition, look at them first as a kind of science of the day. In other words, they used, let's say, certain potions and certain charms and certain uh, behavior because it worked in the past. So it was the kind of science of the day. They didn't have the technology we did, but they knew that if you did certain things, certain other things weren't going to happen, usually certain bad things. Secondly, they viewed the world as being populated by demons, by malevolent, invisible forces. Now, this sounds like a very bizarre idea. But if you look at, say, things that we're afraid of, like viruses, these are invisible, malevolent forces. And we take action to try to prevent them from hurting us. This is exactly the same view that they had. There are invisible, malevolent forces trying to hurt us, and we have to take certain action to try to prevent that, or if they do hurt us, to try to cure ourselves of, us, of this. So I would call it a kind of proto-scientific approach. And I would say that in the history of Jewish mysticism and magic, there are four kinds of Jewish magic. One is predictive magic, in other words, using certain techniques to try to predict the future so if it's going to be good, you can take advantage of it. And if it's going to be bad, you can either mitigate the effect or avoid it altogether. And we have a whole industry in, a, in our co contemporary society, futurology, even weathermen. They're ultra and stock market analysts. They're, everybody's trying to predict the future for the same reasons that they were. Then you have preventative magic, taking, using certain techniques to try to prevent certain things from happening to you. An amulet can be used in, in this regard. It, it tries to keep certain evil forces away from you. I mean, that's why people take flu shots. It's kind of a modern form of an amulet to try to keep the viruses away from you. And what does a virus mean? A virus is, means it's in the air. It means it's invisible and it's malevolent. Then you have curative magic, which is the use of certain techniques to cure a person who has been adversely affected by some kind of evil force. And you use, say, potions, called today drugs, pharmaceuticals. You use charms, spells, amulets, folk medicine. Some of it not very unlike what we're using today. And then you have creative magic, the most prominent example being the creation of artificial life, uh, usually formed around the uh, legend of the golem. So I would say that you have all of this kind of magic within Jewish folklore and within Jewish mysticism. And um, in Jewish mysticism, you also have the idea of what they call the drawing down of the divine flow, called in Hebrew the shefa, the divine influx. In other words, there's good stuff up there, there's divine energy up there, and you want to draw it down to help you achieve your most material goals. In other words, the most spiritual thing in the universe, the flow of divine grace, if it's brought down to our world and channeled in the right direction, helps bring about the most material results, like, let's say, prosperity, 
fertility, safety, and uh, the creature, fulfillment of the creature needs. Shekhinah is one of the most important contributions of, of Kabbalah. It balances the patriarchal view of God. Right? God is described predominantly, almost exclusively, in masculine terms. In most of, in most of, Western, religious, in most of Western religious literature, God is seen as the, as the king, as the judge, as the ruler, as the warrior. And that masculine depiction of God, Kabbalah is really offering a critique a theological critique and saying that this is an inadequate way to picture God. God should be seen as equally male and female. So in some ways the feminine depiction of God is emphasizing the more intimate side of God. God as mother. God as the constant companion of Israel. The other amazing thing about Shekhinah is that in some ways it's a in some ways it's a it's a recovery, a rediscovery of the ancient goddess. Of course, if we go back to the ancient Near East, we have many goddesses, Anat, Asherah, Astarte, just to speak of the Canaanite forms of the goddess. And we find in the Bible a, a very strong criticism of Canaanite fertility worship. The prophets are railing against the people because some of them are attracted to the Canaanite goddesses. But we know that there were Israelites who worshipped the goddess. There were even Israelites who tried to combine worship of the goddess with worship of the Hebrew God. For example, archaeologists have found material on which is written to Yudhevavhe and his Asherah, to God and his goddess. Now the Bible condemns this kind of syncretism, this com combining of of monotheism with, with paganism. And in later Judaism, you find hardly any references to the goddess. And yet in Kabbalah, the goddess re-emerges. You might say that the goddess has now been made kosher. And that, I think, is a startling, a startling development. It somehow, it, it shows, this shows that the, the feminine depiction of God had a strong hold on people and answered a, a deep basic human need for God to be intimate and accessible and not just the, the ruler in heaven. This is how the Zohar interprets the opening words of Genesis. The Hebrew is Bereshit bara Elohim, which we usually translate in the beginning God created. But the Zohar insists on reading the words in the precise order in which they appear in Hebrew. Bereshit, in the beginning. Bara, it created. Elohim, God. In the beginning, it created God. The Zohar takes that to mean, in the beginning, infinity created God. Now what could that possibly mean? God is now the object of the verse, not the subject, which sounds impossible or heretical, but the Zohar, I think, is saying that infinity is the true reality of God. Anything else that we call God is puny compared to that. That's our own imagination or our own, our own estimate of what God could be. It doesn't do justice to the true reality of God. So infinity brought about all that we think of as God. And for the Zohar, that's the meaning of the opening of Genesis. In the beginning, infinity created what we call God. Well, the first thing to understand is that the Zohar is very concerned with Jewish practice. And the first set of secrets that it's concerned with are the secrets of why you do certain things the way you do them. Why you leave three little hairs sticking up from the base of your phylacteries, of your tefillin. Why you pour off a few drops of wine every time you recite the ten plagues at the Passover Seder. Uh, 
Small, inexplicable things are explained by the Zohar as having deeper meanings. In fact, both of those things that I mentioned are sacrifices to the demonic forces. The demonic forces, the forces of evil, want their, uh, want their piece of the pie. They want to dip their beaks in the religious practice, so to speak. And you give them a little something. When the Zohar presents its view of underlying reality, it definitely says that evil is to some degree separate from God. The forces of evil can work for God. They can be God's employees. They can also be simply obstructions, leftover materials from creation, like tripping over a beam or a brick on a building site. Something got left around and it served as an obstruction. But certainly there are forces of evil that are slightly different, and they do mischief. There were always demons and evil spirits in Talmudic Judaism. One of the most interesting ones was Lilit. Lilit was, according to the one rabbinic reading of the Bible, Adam's first wife. That is to say, the rabbis taught, the woman in Genesis 1 is not the same woman in Genesis 2. The woman in Genesis 1 is Lilit. The woman in Genesis 2 is Eve. Eve is not the same as Lilith. Lilith left Adam, got tired of him, and went off to become the queen of the demonesses. She is the queen of nocturnal emission and crib death. And as a popular amulet, uh, there are amulets sold to protect infants from Lilith. She's also become a feminist icon in liberal Judaism, which is an odd thing. You can walk down the streets of a Jewish neighborhood, walk into a conservative temple and find a copy of Lilith magazine, which is the magazine of Jewish feminism, and then you can walk across the street to a Jewish bookstore in Los Angeles, in St. Louis, wherever, and buy an amulet to put in your child's crib to protect them from Lilith. The most ancient idea is that God has multiple names, and these names have power. Already from the time of the Talmud, there were secret names of God, and these names never left Kabbalah. Eventually, invoking these names was seen as a way to protect yourself from evil forces. Many Jews of the, the last generations used to wear a little mezuzah, a little gold amulet around their neck with the basic Jewish prayer, the Shema, in it now. There's no commandment to wear a mezuzah around your neck. Uh, what it is is, in prior generations, they had worn amulets around their necks to protect them, to gain uh, uh, a spouse for them, to protect them from disease, to ward off evil. These amulets were based in sacred names. The idea that there's a dichotomy between the body and the soul really began in the Talmud, in the Midrash. And they said that there are in fact five names for the soul. And Jewish philosophy began to employ three of these, saying that there's a lowest part of the soul that dwells in the gravesite. There's an emotional soul that goes and lives with God in heaven when people die. And there's a transcendent soul, a spark of God that dissolves back into God when a person dies. Therefore, a person's soul really has three parts, the physical soul, the emotional soul, which has gone to live in the celestial garden of Eden with God, and the transcendent divine soul, which dissolves back into God. Now, from this came an interesting set of practices to Kabbalah. That is, first of all, the highest part of the soul in order to dissolve back into God takes at least a year to rise up to God, and it requires a lot of help. So from the Zohar, among other sources, came the idea that the mourner has to recite a certain prayer called the Kaddish, in which God's name is sanctified. And the recitation of that prayer, once a day, three times a day, once a week, whatever they can manage, will help push that highest level of the soul back to God. At the same time, the grave site, the graveyard, 
really contains the lowest level of the soul. So if a person goes to visit the grave, that's not a simple emotional thing to do. There is a meaning to going to the grave. The soul of the deceased lives there. And if they're the soul of a very great saint, then their soul has great mobility. If you pray there, that prayer will be transmitted to the lower soul, which is still connected to the emotional soul, which is still connected to the transcendent soul, which has dissolved into God. So that is a place to go to pray. That is an acupuncture point of spirituality. Or if you have a deceased relative, somebody who cared about you, an elderly grandparent, let's say, and you pray at their grave, they will take the trouble to communicate that message to God. So graveyards became positive places to the mystics, particularly in Svat. And Svat is dotted with graves going back to the Hellenistic period that have great meaning and are pilgrimage sites. One of the great Svat rituals was the rite, the cult, shall I say, of the Shekhinah and the cult of the divine marriage. Now, people don't really think about this when they go to temple in America and rise at the end of a certain hymn and bow and sing, Come, O Bride, Come, O Bride. But in fact, the Svat Kabbalists viewed the Friday night service and meal as a wedding feast when the divine parts of God above unified with the earthly feminine aspect of God in the world, the Shekhinah, and they had sexual union on Friday night. And this has survived into general Jewish practice to this day. Well, Abraham Abu Lafia was born in 1240 in Saragossa, and then he peregrinated actually almost all his life to Tudela, to Italy, to Greece, to Akko, the land of Israel, back to Greece, back to Italy, back to Spain, again back to Greece, back to Italy, and then in Sicily, where he apparently died in 1291. So that's a very intense, uh, uh, what's called an itinerant scholar, or an errant scholar. He did it because uh, he was in search for other types, types of knowledge than regular. I mean, he moved from one center of culture to another and attempted to absorb and to offer synthesis between different forms of knowledge he learned. Basically, he started as a philosopher, and then he started to study Kabbalah, and he offered a synthesis between Jewish philosophy, what's called Maimonides, and between Hasidic Ashkenaz, the Lazaro forms, which is much more magical, much more ling linguistically oriented. So he started with a Greek form of knowledge, Maimonidian philosophy, which is basically Aristotle, and then he combined it with a theory which is totally different, which has to do with the power of language, which is rejected by Maimonides, rejected by Aristotle. So he offered a powerful synthesis between two forms of Jewish culture. The Andalusian one, Maimonides, and the German one, which is Hasid Ashkenaz. So that, the broader picture is that two cultures, totally different, in clash, were brought together by someone who studied both of them in his youth, and around the age of 31, he came with a synthesis, which he attempted to disseminate in all the southern part of Europe. He did it because he believed that he is a prophet. That's the way to achieve prophecy. And he believed that he is a prophet. And even more so because he believed that he is the Messiah. So it was part of his messianic enterprise, which means that he believed that messianism is not just someone coming and bringing the Jews out of exile to a certain place. Hardly he believed it. He believed that messianism is teaching people how to rescue themselves from their body, from their exile in the matter, in the body, which that is for him real redemption.
So for him, the theories that I'm going to elaborate about are not just mystical techniques. They are ways to reach ecstasy, which, which he calls prophecy, which is a redemptive experience. So he believes that if he's going to teach all the people in the world, Jews or non-Jews, he is going to be the Messiah. He will save them. That doesn't mean it's going to happen in the same year. That is maybe an accumulative process. But for him, that was messianism. So his assumption is that he can bring together the idea of intellectual perfection from Maimonides with a technique, how to achieve it instantly from a Lazaro forms. That's why he wrote commentaries on Maimonides' book. On the other side, he wrote commentaries on Sefer Itzira, a book which is very dear to Lazaro forms, and Maimonides never mentioned it, he rejected it basically implicitly. So he attempted actually to capitalize on the two most important medieval achievements in the generation before him. So he offered a technique which has two different, how to put it, aspects. One is how, by combining letters, someone is deconstructing the normal consciousness, and in such a way, he is able to open his consciousness to another form of experience, which means that by reciting letters of the divine name and letters of the Hebrew alphabet, which are meaningless, someone is in a way deconstructing the notions he believes in or his worldview. Magic and the use of amulets as expressing it uh, was a part of the Jewish people from time immemorial. And even before the Kabbalah became uh, a, a discipline, as it were, sometime in the 12th century, as it's normally figured, um, it's dealt with in the Talmud, and we have documentation from the Cairo Geniza of earlier documents having to do with magic. Um, but today, nonetheless, all of these things are called practical Kabbalah, uh, even though some of them have histories going back to the pre-Kabbalistic period. Nonetheless, today, the idea of magic and Kabbalah on a practical level are considered one and the same. I think that amulets in the post-Kabbalah period, or in the Kabbalistic period, stretching up until now, and those in the pre-Kabbalah period, really were made for the same uses. At least up until a hundred years ago, from my own personal experience, the vast majority of amulets were birth amulets. And I think that would have been true in the ancient period as well. Birth was a really traumatic experience for the whole family, particularly for the woman and the child. And as we well know, until modern medicine found solutions for some of the problems that came with birth, the percentage of children and women who died was, was horrendous. Uh, I, I know from some statistic in France that something on the order of 25 or 30 percent of children didn't make it until their second or third year of life. So in times when people pass through traumas that their science for whatever development it was at the time doesn't have an answer, they reach for other answers and those answers generally come in the more mystical traditions. Some of the most famous Kabbalist rabbis such as the Chida, Chaim David Yosef Azulai, uh, would write amulets and these were considered to have particular particularly strong efficacy because they were written by somebody who was so conversant with the Kabbalah. Um, I think that the whole idea of the, well, an another good example would be the, the uh, 
the scroll of the spheres, which for many years was a highly esoteric theoretical attempt to present visually for greater understanding of the Kabbalistic world. Uh, towards the end of the 19th century, um, people began to write this, a shortened version of these Kabbalistic scrolls in a small form, just a, a couple of inches across and maybe a foot or two feet long, which would be rolled up and put in a silver tube, and it became amulitic. It lost all its relationship to theoretical Kabbalah, but of course stemmed directly from it, and the amulitic power of this amulet, which was a general protective amulet, stemmed from the fact that it was the theoretical world of Kabbalah reduced to a small piece that they could carry along with them in a silver tube. After the, the settlement and the development in 16th century Tzfat and 17th century Tzfat, where Kabbalah became such a strong discipline and influence on really the whole of the Jewish people, I think it spread out tremendously. And, and we know that there was a battle with normative rabbinic Judaism, which was won by rabbinic Judaism, but they, I think, won it to no small degree by incorporating many of the elements of Kabbalistic prayer. We have prayers, we have hymns, particularly uh, before, on, before Shabbat, uh, that are a regular part of, of the prayer book today that we don't think about as Kabbalistic anymore. So it clearly had a big, big influence. The, the fact that many of these rabbis would write amulets and that gave an added power to those amulets, I think connected Kabbalah to the people and began to engender this idea that magic is an offshoot of Kabbalah. We know that magic was around for at least 1,500 years before Kabbalah began as a discipline. But in modern interpretation, I think it's almost parallel between Kabbalah on one side and practical magic and amulets on the other. I think that one of the interesting aspects about Kabbalah, which is very little explored, is the visual aspect. Uh, academics in Kabbalah deal with the philosophical and spiritual building of a world as drawn by Kabbalah and really never relate to the visual aspect that is put down in manuscripts and in books. And this can be from the portrayal of the spheres, which you can see in the scrolls, which are aesthetically extremely attractive in many cases, to Kabbalistic prayer books, where there is a whole system of a kavanot, of, of, of of meaning and significance in the way that the words are laid out on the page that is incredibly beautiful, and we can see examples of that as well. Uh, and it's an aspect that I find incredibly attractive, even to the portrayal of figures of, of both the evil spirits and angels in Kabbalistic uh, uh, books that portray, that were made by the makers of amulets. So that's an aspect that I think deserves much more study and is one of the things that people find extremely attractive in addition to the whole idea of mysticism today. Distracting the ego is turning the will to receive into will to receive is the ego is the egoistic will yes and destroying it is becoming divine now this is a ashlagian kabbalistic theme but that fits very well new age ideas of constructing also constructing fighting combating the ego ego seen as something superficial and superficial uh, uh, and finding the inner self in a divine self. So here uh, then there's a new age interpretation of Kabbalah, but it's based on a Kabbalistic theme that appears 
previous to, uh, to this new, new age interpretation. Kabbalah Center annoys almost everyone. Uh, there's various levels, and of course, one is appropriating, saying that they, uh, you know, they, they're in charge. Of this, they do represent a very radical interpretation of Kabbalah, which is perceived as sacred to many Orthodox Jews who perceive Kabbalah in a very different way. For them, teaching Kabbalah to Gentiles, for instance, that's a red line that shouldn't be crossed. The popularization of Kabbalah, again, is something that's very, uh, uh, very offensive to many uh, Orthodox rabbis. And because of that, there's quite a, a polemical uh, uh, struggle uh, uh, against them. Academics are also usually uh, quite against them. Again, after uh, teaching Kabbalah and studying Kabbalah for many years, etc., there's come this group and... Uh, targets more or less the same kind of audience and offers them. I think there is a struggle of possession of Kabbalistic knowledge, who's in the possession of interpreting it and explaining its worth and, and, uh, and uh, significance to the world and world. As a scholar, I don't think we should get into this uh, struggle. We should try to understand things uh, and not be part of it. But I think some of the academics are very opposed because they would say, this is not the Kabbalah. What they're teaching as Kabbalah is not the Kabbalah of the 13th century. Now, for me, that is obvious. Of course it's not, because of that it was inter it's so interesting. If it would be the Kabbalah of the 13th century, it would be a significant uh, a cultural phenomena. But trying to appropriate Kabbalah to the th 21st century and succeeding in that, that is what I think as a historian of culture, of Jewish uh, uh, history, etc., uh, uh, that, that's what I find uh, fascinating. And I think that's what Kabbalists always did, because also Luria, Isaac Luria in the 16th century didn't represent the Zoharic ideas, he appropriated them to the 16th century audience. And that is what Kabbalah Center and many other groups, Bnei Baruch, other groups are doing, and they're doing it very successfully. And I find it uh, fascinating and interesting and really legitimate, if there is such a thing of legitimacy in these issues, as continuing the tradition of Kabbalah, taking things from tradition, and appropriating and explaining them in a way that is significant to people in their own time. The text starts by <laughs> stating that God created the world with 32 paths of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And the 32 paths are defined as 10 sefirot associated with numbers and the 22 Hebrew letters. And ten sefirot in the text are ex explained as the past and the future. That's the time dimension. The space dimension has six directions. East, west, north, south, up and down. And then the, the spiritual human mind-body dimension is good and evil how we choose between good and evil. So that's the 10. And then there's 22 Hebrew letters that are divided into three groups, three mother letters, seven double letters, and 12 simple letters. And these numbers three, seven, and 12 are explained in terms of time and space and that spiritual human dimension. The three mother letters, they're expressed in, in time as fire, water, and air. Fire is like the hot season, water is the cold season, and then the air is the temperate season. So throughout the year, it's divided into three seasons. In space, it's the heavens is fire, the earth is water, and the atmosphere is air. And the human body, the head is associated with fire, the belly with water, and the chest with air. The seven um, in time are associated with the seven days of the week. In space are associated with the seven planets that we can see with the naked eye. 
and the seven openings of the senses, the two ears, the two eyes, the two nostrils, and the mouth. A lot of Kabbalah has to do with the Messianic idea. And the Zohar speaks about the Messianic era as taking place in the sixth, the end of the sixth millennium, preparing for the seventh millennium. And this has to do with uh, the Jewish calendar. And the Jewish calendar starts with Adam. And the first the first two millennia take us from Adam to Abraham. According to the Jewish calendar, Abraham was, was born in 1948 of the, the Jewish calendar. And then the third millennia and the fourth millennia was a time that the, the Torah, the books of the Old Testament were, were formed, and also the Talmud. The fifth millennium in entirety, the Jewish people were in, were in exile, and they had a tradition that the redemption would happen at the sunrise of the, of the sixth millennium. Now, this has to do also with uh, the appearance of the Zohar at the, the end of the 13th century. If you want me to talk a little bit about, about this idea of the sixth millennium, I think it's important to understand um, one of the, the services in, in Judaism is receiving the Shabbat on Friday afternoon. So the, nights, the, the day starts with the night. It says it was evening and it was morning one, one day. So Shabbat starts in, in the evening. And the service of, of receiving the Shabbat was developed here in Tzfat. So it's not just receiving the seventh day. It's about receiving the seventh millennium. So the sixth millennium starts in the Hebrew year 5000, which is 1240 um, CE. And the Zohar appears something like 12, 1290 in, in Spain. So that's like the stars coming out on Thursday night, the beginning of the, the sixth millennium. So if we fast forward from there 250 years, so it takes us to midnight of the sixth millennium. And that's the year 1490. So a lot of changes happened in the world from 1240 to, to 1490. One of them is the expulsion of the Jews from, from Spain, and that's when Columbus was sent and he discovered uh, a whole other part of, of, of the world. There was a shift from thinking ab about the world as flat to thinking of it as, as round. It was the beginning of the, the Renaissance, or the Renaissance was happening. Galileo was uh, that, uh, at that time as well. Im important changes in, in the world. And that's when Kabbalah w became very popular in, in Sfat. The Zohar was first published in the middle of, of the 16th century. So the Kabbalists in, in Sfat had not just manuscripts available, but actual printed texts. And that was the midnight of the sixth, sixth millennium. The Zohar teaches that the rooster crows at midnight announcing the dawn. So the spreading of the teachings of, of a Kabbalah, which is about how to align one's soul and um, become inspired. It's about returning to prophecy. So the teachings of the Kabbalah is about bringing back inspiration to a people that has been suffering in exile for, for, for many years. So the spreading of the, the teachings was about to prepare for the Messianic era. The Zohar can be explained in terms of Sefirot in a more general sense, but Lurianic Kabbalah is primarily about Partsufim, and it's about um, using the metaphor of family as for, for Tikkun Olam. 
uh, repairing the world. The idea is that if we, we see God in our own image, and just like we are both masculine and feminine, young and old, so we see God in, in Kabbalah, there's visions of God in, in Kabbalah as both young and old, both masculine and, and, and feminine. And just like the dynamics that we have with our family, sometimes they're broken and sometimes we repair. So it's a metaphor for the, the entire universe, that there's bro broken aspects of the universe and it's a part of our, our job to, to repair that brokenness. So if we can heal the, the breaks in our, in our family and then extend that outward to our community, to our nation, and ultimately to, to the entire world, this is the process that human beings and, and God are engaged as a, as a partnership in repairing the world.